Welcome to lecture number 14 and chapter number 14, Risk Analysis and Management. So this is going to be the final lecture of the course, uh, apart from a review lecture. Uh, but this is the last lecture where, where I'll be delivering new material. And it will be following the typical uh, lecture style, which is last lecture and chapter review. Then we'll summarize what the lecture and chapter objectives are for this chapter. And then we'll get into the lecture itself and we'll finish up with uh, me pointing you to the review questions that will help you prepare for the quiz and so on. So in the last lecture, what we started to get into was policy, standards, and guidelines. We understood what the difference was between security and compliance requirements. We distinguished between policy, standards, and procedures. We understood what the life cycle of a policy is, and we identified a set of policies that are considered a must for any organization. In this lecture, we're going to talk about risk management. So remember that the course is named risk, has a component in there named risk management. We talk about the relevance of risk management to top management. IT risk management frameworks, risk analysis, so identification and assessment, and risk management mitigation, preparation, and response. So what exactly is risk? The risk is a quantitative measure of the potential damage caused by a specific threat. So remember, in the information security model, we have four components. We have our IT assets, right? We have our information assets that are stored within an IT asset. And then we have our uh, controls around that, it's the ring around that. And then we have different vulnerabilities that are in those particular systems. And we have the threats that are coming into that particular uh, organization or into that system. And the controls are trying to stop them. So risk measures the potential damage that's caused by a specified threat that's coming into the system. And it draws top management attention. Oftentimes what you'll see is that you'll see upper management saying, I want you to quantify something in risk, in terms of risk. And it integrates almost everything that we've discussed in previous chapters. There's a risk management framework from NIST. It utilizes inputs from technology and management experts. And risk management is a component of managing an organization. So that's why it's actually uh, introduced as the last topic of the class, because it really merges those fundamental concepts that we talked about in the previous 13 chapters. So risk management as a component of general management. Performance of an organization is assessed by some measure of profitability. So how profitable is your organization? And more profitable organizations are more valuable and le than less profitable organizations. So if we think about the uh, you know, sports, I'm a big fan of sports, the New York Yankees are often one of the more profitable organizations within baseball. And they're valued uh, more highly than some of the other uh, smaller market teams. And the primary focus of, of managers is to maximize their organization's profits. Nonprofits share a similar risk management concern as for for-profit organizations. So we may write this ma managerial concern as a manager's decision problem, where they want to maximize the amount of profit. They want to maximize the revenues minus the cost. They want to maximize the amount of revenues minus the cost. So they want to minimize the cost as much as possible. And the goal can be accomplished by increasing revenues and you can do this generally by raising prices or selling more units or reducing costs or some combination of both now management literature and typical mba curriculum has focused on guiding managers on reaching these goals however when running organizations managers can find all sorts of unusual things happening all the time that could significantly affect the organization's profit maximizing equation so for example TJ Maxx made provisions for $118 million to deal with credit card incident. And these unusual incidents can affect an organization profits and they need to be managed accordingly. At a very high level, risk manage management is managing the financial impacts of unusual events. And we can include the risk management in a manager's decision problem. So we want to modify it as a manager's decision problem. We want to essentially maximize the revenues minus the cost minus the delta, where delta is the impact of unusual events on the organization. And the, there are two approaches to risk management. One is making risks, i.e. delta, more predictable. And you can do this through insurance and hedging performed by the financial sector of the economy. So, for example, the flood insurance for a data center makes it more makes the financial impact of a flood more predictable. It's equal to the annual premium paid to buy the insurance. And unusual for techies to think about, but second nature for top management to be prepared. It's not an author's expertise, so it's, it's, it's left to other experts. 
Minimizing and preparing for these risks is what we'll be talking about for the rest of this chapter. So there's alternate views for the importance of risk. There's the offense and defense. All sports teams have a mix of offense and defense, like football, for example, right? You have an offensive side of the ball and a defensive side of the ball. In IT, typical IT investments can be think, thought of as offensive measures. So the attack costs, the attack complexity, the battle for customers in more markets, and so on. Information security is a defense arm of the equation. It focuses on ensuring that the organization's existing competitive advantage is not lost due to improper IT implementations. And a related area is ensuring that new risks created in organizations due to IT investments are well managed. So for example, high speed trading. And a quote that's often taken from the sports world is that offense sells tickets or wins games, but defense wins championships. You also think about it, I don't know how many of you are actually Harry Potter fans, but uh, if we think about you know computers as magic, right? The, that's the actual magic. You can think about information security as defense against the dark art. So it's a defensive aspect of it. To make sure that things are being properly implemented, there needs to be a risk management framework. And a framework, as we've mentioned in previous lectures, is a structure for supporting something else. In management literature, frameworks are used when a large number of ideas are to be organized in a manner that can be understood and memorized by many people. And popular risk management frameworks include CERT's Octave, ISO's 27002, NIST 839, recommendations from Microsoft, and recommendations from Google. And similar ideas, collective efforts of best minds in industry to manage IT risks. Pick the most suitable guideline for your organization. Now, one of the things within a risk management framework is creativity. Adoption of one of those standard risk management frameworks is strongly recommended. And make any adjustments that you need for your specific context. Developing your own risk management plan from scratch is dangerous. It's very likely that you're going to be missing other important concerns. And this is only discovered at great cost after a successful attack. So Benjamin Franklin famously said that experience keeps a dear school, yet fools learn in no other. Our preference in, in this particular class is the NIST 839, which is very compatible with the other chapters presented in the class. In the NIST 839 risk framework, NIST recommend, uh, has recommendations for managing information security risk. It is published as a special publication, the 839. And the version of the time of this writing is dated 2011 and is developed with inputs from civil, defense, and intelligence communities. It provides an information security framework from the federal government. It's very general. It's useful for a vast majority of commercial and not nonprofit organizations. And high security environments such as military bases or special laws such as HIPAA will use more stringent procedures. IT risk within the 839 framework is defined as the risk associated with the use of information systems in an organization. It's one of the many risks facing organizations. NIST recognizes that risk management is not an exact science. It recommends that senior leadership be involved in IT risk management. IT risk management is, should be integrated with the design of business processes. So it's not something that you think about after the fact. It's something that you think about as you're designing business processes. And the 839 framework looks as follows. So we have the assess, respond, monitor, and then we have the frame in the middle. So the four components, the risk frame, the risk assessment, risk, assess, uh, risk response, and ongoing risk monitoring. The risk frame establishes the context for risk management by describing the environment in which the risk-based decisions are made. It clarifies to all members in the organization the various risk criteria used in the organization. And the criteria include assumptions about the risks that are important, responses that are considered practical, and levels of risk that are considered to be acceptable. It also identifies any risks that are to be managed by senior leaders and executives. So it sets the context, it sets the frame, it sets the environment. That's what the risk frame looks at, looks like right here. That's why it's in the center of this particular triangle. An example of a risk frame can be highlighted by the presidential candidate Mitt Romney in the 2012 presidential debates. There was only one reference to terror in the president's 2001 State of the Union address. The very next year, after the 9-11 attacks, there were 36 references to terror in the 2002 
State of the Union ad uh, address. And the frames change the priorities of the executive branch of the U.S. government. So basically what happened was that after 2001, after the 9-11 attacks in the 2002 uh, State of the Union, what happened was that the framing was different. The framing was focused on terror. And this was highlighted by Mitt Romney in 2012. Risk assessment identifies and aggregates risks for facing the organization within the context of the risk frame. The, if we recall the definition of risk, it's the quantitative measure of the potential damage from a threat. Risk assessment develops these quantitative estimates by identifying threats, identifying vulnerabilities in the organization, and identifying harm of the organization if threats exploit vulnerabilities. And it's discussed in greater detail in the next section. Risk response addresses how an organization responds to risks once they're determined by risk assessments. So the frame sets the entire context. The risk assessments look and assesses the types of risk within the organization. This can be drawn from, say, vulnerability assessments, the type of assets you have within your organization, and so on and so forth. And then the risk response addresses how the organizations will respond to the risks once they're determined from the risk assessments. And it focuses on the development of consistent organization-wide response to risk. It's consistent with the risk frame. Following the standard business procedure, risk response consists of developing alternative courses of action for responding to risk, evaluating these alternatives, selecting appropriate courses of action, and implementing risk responses based on the courses of action. Risk monitoring evaluates the effectiveness of organizing risk management plan over time. It involves verification that the planned risk response measures are implemented, verification that the planned risk responses satisfy the requirements derived from the organization's missions, business functions, regulations, and standards, and determination of the effectiveness of risk response measures. Also, it focuses on the identification of required changes to risk management plan as a res result of changes in technology and business environment. So it's not just enough to set the risk framework in place, you need to also be able to monitor it on an ongoing basis. So activities in the outer circles are performed sequentially. You move from risk assessment to risk response to risk monitoring. So again, we have the framing, we have the entire context of which risk is being set up within the organization, sets the entire context, sets the frame, sets what's to be expected. Then we assess the risks, we respond to the risks accordingly, and we monitor them as well. And this continues so, uh, in, a, in a cyclic basis, but it must be done in this particular order. The framing sets up the context for the assessment, the response, and the monitoring. So you move from the risk assessment to the risk re response to risk monitoring. The risk frame informs sequential step-by-step -step activity. So for example, the threats that are identified from the risk frame serve as input to the risk assessment. And the outputs from the risk assessment component, i.e. the risks, serve as input to the risk response component. Our adaptation, and this uses bi-directional arrows everywhere in the figure. We have used the directed arrows to connect the outer circles. And this better represents the sequential nature of activities and information flows from risk assessment to response to monitoring. The risk assessment uh, component in the NIST 839 framework all includes two activities, identifying risks and quantifying these risks. NIST risk assessment is also called risk analysis. In this usage, quantification activity of NIST risk assessment is called risk assessment. Specific context should help you disambiguate the meaning, meaning of the term risk assessment. So the risk assessment model, we can build on the threat model that we developed earlier in the class to build a risk assessment model. Threat analysis does not conduct a formal analysis of potential threat outcomes of threats. It's limited to identifying potential problems. Risk assessment adds an analysis of outcomes of to identify threats. It's written as risk is equal to the damage as a result of the specified threat or risk is equal to damage with threat in, in, in the parentheses. Risk is a damage output as a function of the threat input. Since the threat is composed of an actor, a motive, and, a, and an asset, risk is equal to damage and in parentheses actor, motive, and asset. So we can see it broken down in this fashion. 
The risk is broken down based off of the threat, which is composed of the actor, the motive, and the asset, as well as the damage right here. So a risk is damage output as a function of the actor, motive, and assets. For example, one of the threats identified was the actor. There's a remote hacker, and then there's the asset, which is the user credentials database. The motive is to try to get these uh, credentials on banking websites. And during the threat analysis, we do not consider the potential impact of such a threat. The risks can be, re can be written as risk statements. So provide all information necessary to communicate information about risk risks to concern uh, parties. So for the example threat, we can write the associated risks as the first risk is a remote hacker may steal user credentials with the intent of uh, to try and use uh, these credentials on a banking website. So this may lead to lawsuits which will drain profits as well as management time. Risk two is a remote hacker may steal user credentials with the intent of trying these credentials on banking websites. This may lead to adverse publicity, which can hurt our business in the short term. The same threat may be associated with multiple risks if the threat can cause multiple forms of damage. And risks are combinatorial, they multiply rapidly. So for example, there are two actors, a remote attacker and a disgruntled employee. And there's two assets, information assets and hardware assets. There are four potential threats, two times two, if there's only one motive. And it adds two forms of damage, financial, financial loss and information loss. So there's eight potential risks to consider just from these two actors and these two assets. And even the smallest real world organization can have tens of act, uh, assets, actors, motives, and damages. So this can result in tens of thousands of potential risks. And most organizations can only deal with say five to 10 risks at a given time. So risk, risk frames are very important. Prune out the unlikely risks. Develop organizational consensus on pruned risks. What are the risks that are pruned out that the organization can actually have some consensus on such that they can prioritize what they need to focus on in terms of risk? Now, there must also be mechanisms to quantify risk. You know, in my dissertation, you read some of the stuff within my dissertation, you know, the SCADA papers. My dad said, you know, you did a great job, but you need to be able to quantify the amount of risk that an organization faces such that they know how to act accordingly. And once the risks are identified, quantitative measures for risk can be developed. And there's two measures that are estimated, likelihood of risk and potential damage of, upon occurrence of the risk. So risk is likelihood times damage. So for example, let's say that the probability of an attack in the coming year is 1%. Also say that the monetary damage from the lost sales is $10,000 in profits. The risk is the likelihood times the magnitude, which is equal to 0 0.01, which is the 1%, times 10000 which is $100, $100. And all risks within the risk frame can be prioritized. So you want to prioritize the risks accordingly. Now there's other risk management frameworks that exist as well. And you wanna select the risk management framework that is most appropriate for your organization. The general frameworks such as the International Standards Organization has Octave, and then there's context specific frameworks such as Sarbanes-Oxley, which IT general controls for reliability of financial reporting by publicly traded companies. ISO, reserved ISO 27000 series of standards for information security matters. So standards starting with the digits of 27. As of December 2012, this includes at least six standards. On the next slide, what we're going to talk is note, we're going to note the parallels between the NIST 839 and the ISO 27001 standards. The NIST assess phase maps the ISO plan phase. The NIST response phase responds to the ISP ISO do phase and the NIST monitor phase maps to the ISO check and act phases. So what this really shows is that there is a mapping or there is a relationship or there's a consistent view of thinking about how to manage risk even between NIST and ISO. So the ISO 27001 is a standard that specifies the requirements for an information security management system. It states that ISO adopts a process approach for implementing information security. All processes follow a Deming's plan, do, check, act model. 
PDCA. Planning phase is organize established policies and procedures to manage information risks. Do phase is these procedures are operated. Checking phase is the performance is measured against a plan specification and presented for, to management for review. And act phase is review these results to improve the policies and procedures for the next plan and uh, next iteration of the plan phase. The 27002 is a standard that specifies a set of controls to meet the requirements specified in 27001. It's a documents that set uh, a set of uh, security techniques. It maps the controls we have discussed throughout the class. So controls are divided into the following sections. Asset management, human resources, human or physical envi and environmental, communications and operations, access control, info, uh, information systems, uh, acquisition, development, and maintenance, inf information security, incident risk management, business continuity management, and compliance. Now, if we look at the following uh, four that are left, the O3, guidance for an implementation of the ISMS, with the information, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the information systems uh, management system, and then the O4, which is the measurement and metrics for an ISMS, then the O5, which is a standard for information security risk management. Information security risk management process consists of seven sequential steps. Context establishment, risk assessment, risk treatment, risk acceptance, risk treatment plan implementation, risk monitoring and review, and risk management process improvement. And alignment with the four phases defined in uh, 27001 is shown in the next slide. And the 27006 is guidelines for accreditation of organizations that offer ISMS certification. So if we look at, you know, the ISO uh, 27001 and the ISO 27005, the planning phase that's pre presented in 001 is really broken down in 005 as context establishment, risk assessment, development, developing risk treatment plan, risk assessment, and those are the four components for the planning phase. For the do, there's the implementation of risk treatment plan. So this is what it was in 001, this is what it is in 005. With the check, there's a continual monitoring and reviewing of risks, and then the act is maintain and improve IS risk uh, management process. Now, if we think about some of the other risk management frameworks that are out there, such as Octave, Octave stands for Operationally Critical Threat Asset Vulnerability Evaluation. It corresponds with the risk assessment phase of the NIST 839 framework and is developed by the Software Engineering Institute, SEI. It's located at uh, CMU. It's a federally funded organization that's taken stewardship for coordinating various activities important to the software industry. Octave is developed with the large organizations in mind, so 300 employees or more. And it's generally maintain. It's generally have them maintain their own IT, IT infrastructure. So they maintain their own IT infrastructure. They don't necessarily get help from external uh, organizations. They have the capability of managing their own information security operation. So this is specifically designed for larger organizations where some of you may actually be working at right now. The three phase approach to examine organizational and technology issues assembles comprehensive picture of the organization's information security needs. So the octave phases, three phases, phase one is identifying critical assets and threats to those assets, pretty standard, we've done that before. Phase two is identifying vulnerabilities, both organizational and technological, that expose those threats, creating risk to the organization. And phase three is developing practice-based protection strategy and risk mitigation plans. Uh, to support the organization's mission and priorities. Octave is composed of a series of workshops, so it's facilitated by outside experts. It's conducted by inter interdisciplinary analysis team of three to five of the organization's own personnel. The method takes advantage of knowledge from multiple levels of an organization and activities supported by the catalog of good or known practices, as well as surveys and worksheets. This is used to elicit and, and capture information focused discussions about problem solving sessions. And there's many parallels to the Octave, such as ISO 27000 and Octave and the NIST 839. Now Sarbanes-Oxley is another type of risk management framework. So at this point, we're just going through different types of risk management frameworks that may be useful for your organization. 
High stakes environments and specialized guidelines become necessary. So generic guidelines such as the 839 become inadequate. The financial reporting by publicly traded companies is a big driving, driver of information security hiring between 2003 and 2008. And entire courses are dedicated to SOX compliance. So terms added in information security vocabulary include PCAOB, Section 302, Section 404, Internal Controls, and IT General Controls. And the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002 is the final years of the 20th century. It's one of the most euphoric rises in the stock prices and financial history, known as the dot-com boom. In the late stages, there was a pressure to justify lofty stock prices, and some of the most well-respected uh, executives forged their account books. So MCI WorldCom showed that sale showed sales that didn't actually occur, and then Enron actually hid costs and they cook, cooked their books significantly. And this helped uh, the personal profits of the executives. In the courtroom, the executives denied culpability. They argued for trust in accounting staff and auditors. And they argued that firms' operations were too complicated for them to know all financial details. In the public domain, management experts, the public and, uh, and lawmakers, convinced that managers knew exactly what they were doing. So they, knew, they thought that the executives knew exactly what they were doing and that the pleas of ignorance only attempted to uh, exploit legal loopholes and avoid penalties. So the implications were that awareness of dependence and retirements on stock markets, majority of assets were invested into US stock markets and awareness of verbal and implicit directions. There was no paper trail for evidence. So there was significant public pressure on Congress and they passed the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002. And Senator Paul Sarbanes led, led this, along with Representative Michael uh, G. Oxley. And the voting pattern was that it was almost unanimous, 423 of uh, possible 434 votes in the House and 99 of the 100 possible votes in the Senate. So if we break it down, what were the key points within, the, uh, within Sarbanes-Oxley? There's 302, Section 302, which is very important. One, the, the part that I've circled here is that the signing officer has reviewed the report and it's based on the officer's knowledge, the report does not contain any untrue statement of a material fact or omit the material fact necessary to, in order to make the statements in light of the circumstances under which the statements were made not misleading. So it's basically trying to put in policies in place such that the risk to an organization is significantly minimized so that organizations or executives within those organizations know exactly what they need to do. Other important provisions is 906 is corporate responsibility for financial reports. So making sure that the financial reports are having some sort of corporate responsibility associated with them. Continuing on with uh, 404, the key point in 404 is the attest uh, attestation made under the subsection may be made in accordance with the standards of attestation engagements made uh, issued or adopted by the board. So the overall SOX implications, Section 404 of Sarbanes-Oxley introduced the concept of standards-based verification of internal control. It replaced self-created procedures developed by auditing firms and issued auditing standards. And some of these auditing standards are, say, the PCAOB, which is a Public Company Accounting and Oversight Board. It's a body created by the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. It develops standards to be used for SOX attestations. And the standards that are of greatest, greatest interest are AS5, an audit of internal control over financial reporting that is integrated with an audit of financial statements, and AS12, which is identifying and assessing risks of material misstatement. So the SOX directions for IT, as it breaks down for IT, is Section 21 of AS5, Overall Direction of SOX Audit. And then there's section 36 of AS5, which directs auditors to two, uh, to two paragraphs. And then it's paragraph 29 of AS12, which directs auditors to the paragraph. And then appendix B of AS12, which is the controls. So we can see all of these paragraphs right here, which I'll let you go ahead and read. So now we know the law, but how do we actually get to a client? What do we do? So internal controls over financial reporting. It's defined in Appendix A as AS5 as internal control over financial reporting is a process designed by or under supervision of the company's principal executive and principal financial officers or persons performing similar functions 
and effective by the company's board of directors, management, and other personnel to provide reasonable assurance regarding the reliability of financial reporting and the preparation of financial statements for external purposes in accordance with GAAP and includes those policies and procedures that pertain to the maintenance of records that in reasonable detail accurately and fairly reflect the transactions and dispositions of the assets of the company, provide reasonable assurance that the transactions are recorded as necessary to permit pr preparation of financial statements in accordance with the, with the general, generally accepted accounting principles and ex receipts and expenditures of the company are being made only in accordance with authorizations and management of directors of the company and provide reasonable assurance that re regarding prevention or timely detection of unauthorized acquisition, use, or disposition of a company's assets that could have a material effect on financial statements. So it's a subset of overall control activities in the firm. In the Sarbanes-Oxley domain, control activities are defined as procedures, methods, and policies that, respond, that responsible per, per, persons use to reduce the likelihood of occurrence of risky events to acceptable levels. And this is consistent with the definition of IT security controls that we've used in this class. So the safeguards are used to minimize the impact of threats. So the IT general control. So, okay, so now I know I need to verify the controls over financial reporting, but how do I exactly do it? So we're really breaking it down in, in a lot of detail right here. Don't worry too much about all of these details, by the way. I mean, it's just kind of showing you the thought process that goes behind it in terms of setting these policies what they were motivated by, and so on and so forth. So the bulk of internal control audits activities performed by auditors and accountants. However, they rely on IT experts to assist in evaluation of controls exemplified in AS12 Appendix B, and it's traditionally called IT general controls. IT general controls are defined in AS to paragraph 50. And you can read that right here. The key thing from here is that, for example, information technology General controls over program development, program changes, computer operations, and access to programs and data help ensure that specific controls over the processing of, of transactions are operating effectively. So AS2 definition only by example, the basic idea is secure the underlying IT platform. So for example, weaknesses in password requirements, there's a likelihood of fraudulent transactions that increases significantly. So our definition of IT general controls control activities performed by the IT that ensure correct processing of business transactions by the organization. In a Sarbanes-Oxley engagement, IT experts are involved in the auditing of IT general controls. So there needs to also be a procedure for verification for these controls. So we, were, we talked about, you know, the different, you know, Sarbanes-Oxley and then how it came down where, you know, the, the, the breakdown from the financial investments or financial misreporting that was put down in the early 2000s and all the different components in there and how it drove the breakdown of IT general controls. But there also needs to be a procedure for verifying that those controls are actually put in place accordingly. The industry has developed a procedure for an audit of IT general controls over financial reporting. So the procedure is look at the firm's financial statements, identify material line items, Identify business processes feeding into these items. Identify IT platforms that support these processes. So for example, the operating systems, databases, applications, web servers, and networks. Verify that the IT general control objectives are satisfied for these platforms. Report these material weaknesses and repeat annually. For number five, 12 IT control objectives are identified based off of best practices. So acquire and maintain application software, acquire and maintain uh, technology and infrastructure, enable operations, install and credit uh, solutions and changes, manage changes, define and manage service levels, manage third, levels, third party services, ensure system security, manage the configuration, manage the problems and incidents, manage data, and manage the physical environment and operations. So how do we compare compliance versus risk management? Why don't, why don't we just outsource risk management to legislatures and industry experts and just comply with the laws, regulations, and industry codes that these experts develop? Because what I just covered is very dense and in a lot of ways it's very, very, uh, I, for lack of a better word, tedious and, and, and boring in a lot of ways. 
but we have to give it some thought. Compliance is only a subset of risk management. There's a minimal set of risk management activities that prevent catastrophe that could affect others. Compliance does not regulate risks of, that affect you or your organization. So for example, there's lotteries and vices and alcohol, home and driving. I mean, there, there, it, compliance doesn't mean that you're actually going to be regulating the risks that only affect you. So risk management has to be done at an organization level. There could be entities out there that could help set guidelines or policies or standards out there, but it's really up to the organization to make sure that they're managing their risks uh, appropriately. IT compliance ensures the safety of others. It ensures that other people are safe. You alone are responsible for ensuring that your actions do not put your organization at risk. So IT risk management is everything you do to prevent harm to yourself. It's preventing the risk that's coming upon yourself. So this is a lengthy lecture, but it really hi highlighted the fundamentals of risk management. The relevance of risk management to top management, so making sure that that's taken into account on the bottom line of the profitability of an organization. We talked about different IT risk management frameworks, such as NIST 800 and the ISO frameworks. And those, those are very, very detailed and they can get very mundane, but it's important to at least get an overview, which is what I provided in the, in the lecture. Then we talked about risk analysis all the way from identification, assessment, and evaluation. And we talked about risk management, which is mitigation, preparation, and response. So you can refer to chapter uh, 14 for a full list of review questions. And as always, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Thanks.